You're listening to Brain Biohacking with your host, Kayla Barnes. We dive into all things optimal health, nutrition, peak performance, cognitive excellence, biohacking, longevity, and so much more. I am so excited for today's conversation on a very important topic, something that I love to speak about on my platform, but today I have an expert in all things EMFs. We're going to be talking about EMF protection, how to protect yourself and your family, what EMFs are, and so much more. Today, I had the pleasure of speaking with Daniel T. Debon, the founder of Defender Shield and internationally recognized expert in the field of electromagnetic radiation and shielding electronic emissions. Daniel's concern regarding the health impact of electronic radiation emissions grew from over 30 years of engineering experience in the telecommunications industry where he held a variety of leadership and executive positions at Bell Labs, AT&T, SAIC, and Telcordia. Throughout the course of his career, Daniel has created requirements for large telecommunication systems, led technical divisions responsible for establishing industry standards, and formed analysis adherence testing for next-generation digital transmission systems. Daniel also oversaw laboratories which analyzed electromagnetic radiation or EMF interference, electrical signals, and digital formats. He and the teams he led were looked upon as industry authorities. Dan, it is such a pleasure to have you on my show. You're an absolute expert in all things EMFs. And as we were chatting about before I started the recording, you know, there's a lot of controversy around EMFs, but let's start with the basics. What are EMFs? Well, thank you for inviting me, uh, 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 Kayla. I I really, uh, I'm excited about chatting with you today about the subject because in fact, I'm very passionate about it. Um, electromagnetic radiation is the invisible um, energy that's in our environment uh, that's produced by man-made devices, laptops, tablets, cell phones, um, anything that becomes wireless, and for that matter, wired products also produce emissions. All those devices all those electric devices create emissions. And, and when you use a cell phone, you're connecting to a cell tower. Uh, could be as much as five miles away. Um, that cell tower is creating electromagnetic radiation. It's called radio frequency, RF. Um, uh, and so we have all these sources um, that are around us today that 15 years ago weren't around us. So you you asked the question about the controversy. Well, all of a sudden, all these technologies becoming part of our lives that really didn't exist that many years ago. And the country, the controversy lies in what's the problem and, and how do you want to personally deal with that? If you think it may or may not be a problem, what is your gonna what's gonna change in your lifestyle as a result of your knowledge? So that's what electromagnetic radiation is. And uh, let's chat about it today. That sounds great. So what do we know about it? Because I've made a couple of posts on my Instagram, you know, getting into AirPods, and I highly suggest that you never use AirPods, but everyone's always asking for a study. So what do we know about it right now in terms of the effects on our health? Okay. Um, Literally for the last 40 to 50 years, science has been studying the impact of radio frequency. Back in the 70s, the military did a lot of study work looking for impacts to the military, actually. And so there's been a whole lot of work that's been done for a whole lot of years that much of the data we never really realized was being developed. Um, And the controversy came with you have the service providers saying there's absolutely no problems whatsoever. And then you have the research community saying, well, we think there is a problem. And these are the clinical evidence of those problems. And so that's a conflicting battle between the uh, uh, standards, uh, the the service providers and, and the medical community. 
Ironically, federal government experts, those who manage the F FDA, uh, uh, FCC, excuse me, Federal Communications Commission, they're responsible for defining the standards. And they are in controversy uh, with the uh, world, the community as well. So it is a community. Look, um, when uh, trans fats, uh, there was a little uh, unknown elect uh, 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 chemical engineer that said it's not the cholesterol in eggs that are killing you. It's the trans fats that are being used to cook your French fries that are killing you. And it took probably 40 years for that to be banned. It was only banned like two years ago in, in the U.S. It was banned outside the U.S. Um, for years, but not in the U.S. So it's not unusual when we have stuff getting into our lives that all of a sudden we gain a bit of knowledge about it and we understand the toxicity of those things we introduce in our environment. And that's where the controversy is. I used to smoke cigarettes when I was 12 years old, which is quite a number of years ago. At that time, science knew there was a link between cancer of the lungs and cigarette smoking. But you know what? None of us knew that at that time. We knew about the being a big man or a, a wonderful looking woman smoking a cigarette. Yet, in the uh, in the actually the mid fifties, um, we already knew that it was a problem. It just took so many years before ultimately we found enough evidence to say in the courts of law, by the way, that it's a problem. So that's where we are. We're sort of in the middle of all this, where there's there's conflicts occurring in the marketplace for different factions that are in that space, and that's why it's controversial. Yeah, I, I agree with that totally. And so many things. This is a pattern across the board. Like you said, with food, there's ingredients in, in beauty products and there's ingredients yeah. in all sorts of chemicals that are banned outside of the U.S., but we just seem to take a very long time to catch up. Yes. So, so I agree with that point completely. So let's talk about 5G. So I've had 5G turned off on my cell phone ever since it became available. Okay. But let's talk about it. How much more of a danger does it pose to our health? And what are we really looking at here? Uh, Kayla, it's really interesting. Uh, the evolu 5G is fifth generation. That's what it means. So there were four generations before that that occurred in telecommunications that went from analog signals to digital signals. And every time they went from one to the next, there was technology changes that were implemented. So uh, two, three, 4G, 5G, they up to 4G anyway, they, they roughly have been working around one to two gigahertz. That's the speed in which they work at. And the power levels that they work at are roughly the same all those years. With 5G, a part of 5G is similar to that. In other words, we know a lot about it because uh, these technologies have been around so long. When we did, we've done clinical work, we've seen the implications of that through thousands and thousands of studies. And so we do know that, that that has a negative impact to our bodies, but it's a very known understanding problem. But there's another part of 5G that that is very different. Um, and it's around what they refer to as small cell sites. That, that These tiny little sites in front of your house that generates a signal 750 feet, you can't go any farther than that. It's those small cell sites that are introducing uh, signals, RF signals that are much different than all the stuff that's been in the past. Uh, the, the small cell site can generate over the next couple of years around 23 gigahertz, around 60 gigahertz, much, much, much faster. So the concern about that in the scientific community is we know nothing about it. This, these speeds are much faster and power levels are much higher and they're right in front of our front yard. And that's what the controversy is about. So let's talk more about this. So can we see them? 
are they visible or yeah actually okay. you you really can actually you know when, when you look at a a cell tower they're in the distance and they're really really high and those cell towers are up to 5g today in fact the 5g you turned off in your uh, your cell phone is highly likely to be working at a slightly lower frequency rate than the 4g and below um, so it's not as concerning as the tower that was distance far away from you now in your front yard. If it's on a on a telephone pole or if it's on a light pole or it's on a small pole up 10, 15 feet in front of your house, that's how you know it's small cell sites. They don't go very far and they're typically low to the ground. Wow, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to take a look around and see. Right, you, you'll know it because every 750 feet, you'll see another tower uh, along that road. So, like every other house, will have a, a small cell site in front of it. Wow. So, do you think having the 5G turned off is good enough? So, I've done that on my phone, but is is it protecting me? Actually, this is a broader question you're asking me. Um, it's a matter of um, when you use a cell phone, uh, you have a you can potentially have Bluetooth on, you can have Wi-Fi on, and you can have the uh, 4G on, and you can have the 5G on. They're all separate transmitters within a cell phone. So your question was, if you turn off the 5G, is that better? The answer is yes. It's simple. You're taking four down to three. And if you want, and you don't need Bluetooth or you don't need Wi-Fi, which I don't have on, you can turn those off and only have the cell tower transmission. And you're reducing the environment impact basically by taking those term, uh, uh, those transmitters off and not hitting your body nor staying within the environment you're in. Okay, good. Well, at least I at least I'm protecting myself a little bit more. Oh yeah, no question about it. Yeah, I definitely knew from the very beginning. I was like, I'm not going to do 5G. I work really hard, and we'll get into what people can do to protect themselves. But yeah, for me, it's it's very very important. So I want to talk about AirPods for a second. Um, I made a post on Instagram that so many people commented on. It went a little bit viral. And so many people believe that AirPods are still acceptable. Can we talk a little bit about what that's doing to brain health? Okay. Um, now we're going to get slightly technical. Um, a cell phone works at 1.6 watt per kilogram. That's the power that it transmits at. And remember, at 4G, they can go up to five miles. So even though it's a little small level of power, it goes very far. 1.6 watts. A Bluetooth is dot three watts, five times less power level than a cell phone. All right. Uh, so Bluetooth is now transmitting at dot three watts. It turns out that you can mutate a frontal lobe cell at dot one watts. So it's 15 times less the power level of a standard cell phone. So the so the question is. Do you want a signal, a Bluetooth signal, that can actually pass through for stereo purposes through your head when we know it only takes dot one watts to mutate a cell? Uh, so it's, it's dangerous for the head. But, but remember, it's also a constant transmission that's occurring, and it's going into the frontal lobe, which is sort of has other potential ramifications, and maybe even more so than mutating the cell. It's disrupting frontal lobe uh, brain pattern, uh, which you know is a, a, a big deal with. When you start interrupting alpha and beta and all the other kind of variations you have in your head, there's a, these are electrical magnetic communications within the, the frontal lobe that potentially gets disrupted when you use Bluetooth. So for me, it's very simple. It's like, there may be a problem. Maybe then there won't be a problem for me, but why would I risk it if I don't have to? In my case, I use earbuds with, with uh, 
acoustical links between the ear and uh, a, a speaker, and I eliminate all electronics in front of the head. And that's why I did it, because for some, it's more uh, disconcerting than for others. Um, and, and by the way, uh, a point of fact, uh, it's more likely more in interruptive for women than men. We know that um, electric hypersensitivity, those who feel sensitive about the exposures, uh, they, they can, 20% of the population is roughly uh, electric hypersensitive. Of that, 80% are women. We don't know why. We don't know if it's hormonal. We don't know if it's brain pattern. We don't know what, what the reasons why are, but it's a fact. And so, you know, if you can be take a precautionary measure and simply not do it and find alternative ways of doing it, you're far better off. I agree with that. And I have seen some studies that link cell phone use. I think it was roughly 17 minutes a day for 10 years using the cell phone actually on the head. And I believe it um, led to about a 60% increased risk of brain cancer. So for me, have you seen this study? Yeah. In fact, um, there are many studies like that. And the rough metric is uh, with heavy use, and that's what your description was, you are three times more likely after 10 years to have high frontal lobe cancer. But, you know, realistically, 17 minutes a day for 10 years is almost nothing now. Right. It's, it's, exactly. It's, Think like, of that. Basically, no use in our time and, you know, this time in society because that's all people are doing is, is being on their cell phone. So I agree 100 percent with with everything. And I definitely say to ditch the AirPods right away. You know, kids are using AirPods. And I know that EMF exposure can be even more taxing on a child. So let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Okay. Now you know about 1.6 watts per kilogram, right? right? The standard was created over 30 years ago for a six-foot male. They had an army population that they sampled to determine what the power level should be on a cell phone. That's how 1.6 watts came about. The 1.6 watts was defined because they wanted to make sure the signal would not penetrate the six foot male by one to two inches. And it wouldn't increase the thermal uh, impact by more than two degrees. Why thermal? I'm going to go to sidestep. Uh, RF signal is a microwave signal. Uh, they, by definition, when you put a piece of meat in a microwave oven, the wa water heats between the cells, oscillates the cells, and the, and the meat cooks. Well, it is a power level much less than a microwave, but it is still a microwave signal. And that's why they prevent the heat. Now that we know that, think about this. It represents roughly 3% of the population. How about smaller people that are not six foot? Um, how about women? Their, 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 the resistance path of a signal is likely less for a woman. And how about a child? A long story short, a uh, six foot male goes one to two inches. For a child at six years old, it can go completely through their head. That is a problem because unlike me, I didn't grow up with cell phones. Children today, have a cell phone when they're six years old calling grandma, you know? And so, you know, it, it's a different like use that has never existed before and standards created for people use that doesn't apply anymore. Right. And I also believe that so many of the toys nowadays are being made with, you know, different Bluetooth technologies. So right. I think it's really important to make sure. So if you have a toy in your child, if your child has a toy and it's on the floor playing with it, maybe it's not to its head, but is that something to still be concerned about? Um, a wonderful question. Um, one of the other dimensions, uh, we were talking about 17 minutes a minute ago, right? Mm -hmm. That was like considered heavy use. Um, well, it turns out the duration of use is important. And if you have a cell phone and you use it 
one minute a day, not 17 minutes a day, one minute a day, you're at very, 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 very low risk. So the duration of time, if you use it five hours a day, you're increasing your risk. So the duration of use is important. The other thing that's important is distance. When you talk about a cell phone at your head at 1.6 watts, that has a very different implication if it's four foot away. In, in fact, if you use a cell phone directly to your head, that's when this likely the most concern you should have about the potential long-term impacts. If it's one to two feet away, almost 80% of that concern, that potential danger is gone. By four foot, there's zero, m mostly zero. So I, I, I told you that story because for kids, when they have it in their lap, if there's protection below their lap, so it doesn't um, pass through their body on the body, and there's a distance between the screen of a foot or so, they're fairly safe. Um, uh, uh, but but it's when stuff is really touching your body that it's uh, most concerning for you. Yeah, and I, I feel as if we do have devices touching our bodies often. Um, I do yep. want to go really quick back to AirPods. So one of the comments that I would always get is that the frequencies or the emission is non-ionizing. Can you tell me why that still is is a situation for our health? Okay. We're going to get into more detail than you may want, but I but it's a very important question you're asking. No, I love it. I want to get all the detail. Uh, ionized radiation is X-rays, gamma rays. When 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 you go to the dentist and they put this machine next to your face, and they run into the other room and they put a lead weight on your chest and they zap it and they look to see if you're still there. It's because x-rays are ionized radiation. They can, they can take a cell and disrupt that cell and take the electron around the nu nucleus of the cell and disrupt it and create it a uh, charged electron. In other words, it becomes almost immediately damaged. Mm -hmm. And that's that path is that. So when people say it's only non-ionized, they're thinking of it in the context of x-rays where ionized can, we know instantly it happens. Okay, now that you know that, think of this. Non-ionized radiation is thousands of times less signal uh, frequency rates. So it's a different spectrum, much lower than x-rays. But you realize there are thousands and thousands of research studies that show that there is non-ionizing DNA damage that occurs. It's not the same mechanics to the cell. It doesn't break the cell down the same way. But it, but it is impacting the health of the cell. In fact, the National Toxicity Program, which is a federal government study that was done a, uh, over a 10-year period, it was directly looking at, is there statistical significance from exposure to a transmitting cell phone and frontal lobe cancer and heart cancer? And what they found was after this $25, $25 million study, federal government did this, uh, they found there was a direct, there was a statistically significant increase in tumor, including uh, cancerous tumors, DNA damage to a uh, cell on both the frontal lobe and, and the heart. So th it's a myth that, that there is no damage when you have non ionizing radiation. And the the conf, you know the, the difference difference they're making up from ionized versus non ionized is just not science. Science knows, in fact, it is a problem. Well, that that's a great answer, and I'm glad that we went over that because I think, you know, there's so many people that just check something out on Google, 
Yeah. Um, and they say, oh, you know, it says non-ionizing, so it's not harmful to our bodies. We'll continue using the AirPods all day. Some people I've literally heard sleep with the AirPods in. Oh, that and is they, that is crazy. Um, um, I, I explained the breakdown of the cell in the unionized case. For a non-ionizing case, what the does, calcium penetrates the cell membrane, it, 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 um, there's chemical responses that ultimately lead from that to a DNA damaged cell. So the end result of non-ionizing and ionizing are the same. The mechanics of breakdown are slightly different. And that's science. Right. Well, amazing. So I want to talk about a couple other things that are even more new than cell phones. What about smart cars? I mean, Tesla, smart cars, do we have to be concerned about these things? Is there more radiation from a Tesla than there is a smart car? Let's talk about it. Um, very interesting. When, you know, when we started off, we talked about the sources of emissions. Mm -hmm. In the case of a car, they, that's called all electronic. You're looking at current flow that generates emissions in that car. So the motors for those cars, the, en the engines are motors in each of the wheels. And they're distant from you in the, in the, in the, uh, when you're inside the car. So even though they're generating a high level of emission, there's a distance that you have uh, from the, the wheel well itself. And believe it or not, it's fairly safe. There are more concerns with the monitors because the, they're putting these bigger and bigger and bigger monitors into these things. And they themselves em emit um, uh, uh, emissions, like extremely low frequency stuff that is typically not been in cars in the past. And I'm a little more concerned about that. Uh, but, but let me give you a point of a perspective. If I looked at a monitor 10 years ago, you're looking at a monitor, I'm looking at a monitor. 10 years ago, it could be up to 20 milligauss. It, it, it's a lot of stuff coming out of the, the monitor. But today's monitors, it's like four, five, six milligauss. It's fairly low. So it's low and there's a bit of a distance and you're relatively safe. So believe it or not, Intuitively, you'd think it's really worse, but it's actually not because distance is your friend. That's good to know. I've heard that the um, heat seater and the heated steering wheel can pose a bit of a problem. What do you think? Absolutely. There, there, there are coils that are generating, and when there's current flow in the coil, it's emitting electromagnetic radiation. And it at, if it's in the seat, for example, it's touching your body. And, and, and if you're electric hypersensitive, that is very disruptive. You, you will feel it. It may be ting, tingling or in some ways painful uh, to the body when you, when you do that. So you, I, you're right. There's a coil and that is generating emissions and it could bother those, particularly those who are electric hypersensitive. Yes, unfortunately, um, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, but we'll get a little bit of cold therapy, I guess, on our, on our bottoms and on our hands. If right, we exactly. <laughs> well, well, the, you know, you know, with that kind of stuff, you know, if your car comes with it, um, you just don't turn it on, and, yeah. and you're and you're okay, right? But yeah. if you do, you're exposing yourself. So that's knowing your environment. Yeah, I agree. I do have it in my car, but I have not been turning it on. So I won't turn it on either. <laughs> the more you know, right? Yeah. So let's talk about other sources of EMFs. Um, what about the laptop? Um, there are two types of potential emissions from a laptop. Um, the first is well, you can transmit a Wi-Fi or Bluetooth signal to connect to devices and or the router. And so that's a potential source, particularly if it's close to you, it becomes even a more concerning source. The second 
thing is, um, and I've mentioned this occasionally so far, there's extremely low frequency. Anytime there's current flow, there's an emissions coming out of the device. It's a digital emission coming out of the device. So in general, I always suggest, uh, you know, it's an oxymoron to talk about it as a lap device. Um, you really should think about putting it on your table. And believe it or not, when you do that, you're fairly safe, except if you have the Wi-Fi or Bluetooth on. If you can, it's always true. You should try to connect it with an Ethernet connection, a, a wire to the back of the device. If you're electric hypersensitive, and we deal with a lot of those who are, a laptop in front of someone really can bother them. And so we recommend pushing it away um, using Ethernet and keeping it at one to two feet away as a way of reducing the impact of the, to the body. Um, but you, you, they are definitely a source, and uh, you should be aware that it can impact um, the, your body. Is it true that when you have the computer plugged in, it emits even higher radiation? You know, they, 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 they are these arguments that, uh, that plugged in or not plugged in, there's a difference. And the, the fact is, that it is true um, uh, that there is a difference. But honestly, science really can't tell much of a difference between the emissions plugged in or out the impact of the body, impact of the cell. So um, you're slightly better off unplugging it, but you're much better off pushing it away. Yeah, I agree. Um, when I do you have to use my laptop, I use your guys' pad and I've made some stories about it and people are always like, oh my goodness, what is this? But, you know, as a woman, um, you know, it's so important. It's important for both sexes, but, you know, I think definitely, you know, you're basically putting a laptop and all these EMFs right onto your uterus. So it's right. a big deal. So yeah, let, let's talk about that a little bit. You know, one of the reasons I started uh, in this space was because um, my sons were using their laptop on their lap uh, about 11 years ago for three, four hours at a time. Even at that time, we knew up to 25% of the male can become immobile. The male sperm becomes immobile um, uh, with that kind of ex extended exposure. Wow. And that's what prompted me to think about, you know, we got to fix that if we can. And that's what started our journey. Um, at that time, it was also true that 2% of females um, are impacted and and of that two percent a very small percentage mutates and becomes cancerous so even back then we knew that uh, and here's another story um i i uh we wrote a book radiation Na nation my son and i and we talk about women putting girls putting their cell phone in their back pocket the, the distance between that and the egg in the womb is very short. And so in the book, we said there is some evidence that there could be mutating cells occurring from that signal. And I had a, a friend at that time, he's probably one of the most well-known radiologists in the country, one of the first actually, brilliant, brilliant man. And he said, Dan, I don't believe that's true. And I said, well, you know, there is anecdotal evidence, not statistically significant evidence that shows that's happening. And then several years later, he called me up and he said, I had a, a woman who just had a baby. There were several mutated cells, really strange cells we couldn't figure out. And she was a techie lady. She had all these electronics around her. And he said, you know, you may be right. There may be an influence that occurs to the egg. Now, there, there are some scientists that think that over the next three generations, the practice of putting a cell phone in their back pocket will eliminate our ability to uh, pr reproduce. It's an extreme view, which absolutely is unrealistic and not statistically sound approach. But it's, again, 
why would you risk it if you don't need to? You know, don't put it in your back pocket if you're a 12 year old girl. I agree. Um, and this yes. bra is another popular. Oh, right. Doctor, doctor, I have a cancer where I put my cell phone. <laughs> Give me a break. Right. It's literally true. There's been a lot of uh, clinical studies that talks about the direct correlation of cancerous surface cancer cells, which is unique. It's, it's, it's not the normal breast cancer cells uh, that occur as a result of direct uh, uh, exposure for, for the breast. So that's another one of those things. You really want to be careful about doing it. If, it, you, know, if you believe there, there's a concern, you should have some. Well, I certainly believe there's a concern. I do too. You guys have the great fanny pack that I use um, when I'm on walks or when I'm at the gym right. or, you know, and at the gym, of course, no AirPods, just the wired ones or your Defender Shield um, headphones. So I, I totally agree with that. I want to ask about another device because a lot of people in the, in the biohacking space have one and there's an airplane mode that you can turn on. But the Aura Ring, do you know much about it in terms of? I do. Um, I'll talk about it. In, in in more general context, Th- there are a lot of these devices that are attaching to your arm, your wrist. There are a lot of devices that are for your uh, finger. There's biometrics being analyzed in real time, sleeping patterns, deep sleep, all the benefits of having that technology. Um, I'll tell you how I feel about it through a story. I, I, I like yoga and um, the, 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 we had an instructor who got a, a, a badge, I mean, a, a wristband, and she was telling me how wonderful it was. And I said, do you realize they're using Bluetooth to, to connect to your cell phone and it's constant and it's near your body. It is 24 hours by using those things. And I said, so, you know, I'm an electromagnetic radio expert. Why are you showing me this device that I think is not good for you? <laughs> and I was joking around with her about it. Right. But but it's true. I've actually with some of these rings, we I have association with the uh, um, uh, clinics and I wouldn't introduce it in some of the clinics when we were approached by some to to have these devices that are 24 hours communicating now. Some of these devices are getting more uh, smarter. And what they're doing is dumping loads in 24-hour intervals. So the spurts of data. If you have a device that does that and it's a spurt of data, it's not a constant feed, you're never going to be have a problem with it. But you really got to know uh, how does it communicate with the Bluetooth device. Um, and if it's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, I'd recommend being a bit more cautious about it and maybe find other ways to find out if your heart rate's right. (laughs) Yeah, great point. I try to keep it on airplane mode um, as much as possible. And then when you turn it off airplane mode, it'll start syncing the data. Right, right. Simple simple thing you can do, right? You can can minimize the exposure. So let's talk about saunas for a second and maybe in general, a lot of this new tech um, that's coming out for biohackers, they're saying that it's low EMF. How can they how can they make that happen? For well, example, in a sauna. So I have a sauna. Okay, that, okay. You know, is low a, EMF a sauna or a sauna speaker? Sauna, like an infrared sauna. Okay, okay. Um, there, there's a gamut of emissions with with sauna devices that you should really be aware of. Uh, some believe that they're very safe and they have recognized that there's emissions coming from the electronics they're using and others don't. Um, I always recommend look for the least emitting devices and they'll say it typically, they'll advertise it. Mm -hmm. And they are relatively safe if they're aware of the problem, far more so than those that are not. Uh, So- it, it, it is a, it is there there is a real difference and that difference is important if you're a regular user of those devices yeah absolutely i agree with that well that's that's good to know that we can trust that what emf at home meter do you recommend cuz 
I I've had one, but I I'm not sure if it's the the best quality. You know, it, it's funny. Um, I, I have a a different answer than many. Uh, um, I don't think you need a meter because you have to spend a thousand dollars to have a meter that tells you the accurate conditions in your environment, the ambient in your environment, the the equipment performance in your environment. Um, when you spend a couple hundred dollars or less, they can be orders of magnitude off. And all of a sudden you're panicking and there's really no reason to panic because it's orders of magnitude off or you don't know how to read the meter. Right. I always recommend people just think about their environment they're in. Like a cell phone, we talked about it before. We talked about four transmitters. Mm -hmm. Turn three of them off and you've taken three quarters of the ambient in the environment off by simply turning those devices off. When, when you watch TV and you get one of those boxes that are wireless boxes, that's a transmitter in your room. If you have an Ethernet connection to it, it's a better performing device and you've reduced the emissions. So it's really all about trying to figure out your environment and what devices are transmitting what and where. Um, as a sort of a side note, Wi-Fi should never be in the living room because that's where you live most. It should be in the garage because they can go a couple thousand feet. And by simply pulling it away from you a bit, mm -hmm. um, you, you make a much safer space for you and your family. Um, and mm -hmm. even though it's still wireless, mm -hmm. the, the implications to the family are less the farther away you are with the device. Great point. Um, so we talked about turning off, you know, as many of the modalities on the cell phone as possible. We talked about moving the Wi-Fi router outside. Um, I'm currently living in an apartment, so moving the Wi-Fi router outside is not possible, but I do completely unplug the unit at night. Yeah. So I want to start talking about some ways from a very uh, minimal budget up to a more, you know, um, giving budget, how people can protect themselves and their family from EMFs. Yeah. Okay. So let's leverage what you just mentioned. You turn it off. Well, I'm not as good at remembering to turn things on and off as maybe you are. Mm -hmm. So I have a $10 timer and I use Ethernet throughout my house, but I also transmit from a very far distant part of the house. At night, I have a $10 timer that turns it off and then turns it back on. I don't have to remember it, <laughs> which, which is hard. good for me. <laughs> I'm going to find that. I'm, well, maybe you can email it to me after we get off and I'll link yeah, it. The, so. hey, all these Christmas devices, you know, that turn the lights on and off. It's the same device. It's an on and off switch, basically. Oh, yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, I it's simple stuff. I completely just, uh, when I go to bed, I pull all of the, the, I have a big kind of pad with everything plugged in and I just remove it from the wall entirely. Yeah. Um, so, okay, that's, that's a great way to do it. What, what are some other tips or tricks or biohacks? And, and um, I, I, I talk about um, minimize the bees in the room. Um, and we've talked about this a lot so far, but I'm going to now summarize it. Um, one bee won't kill you, a thousand will, unless you're, you know, you, you're allergic to bees. Um, in other words, the more bees you have in that room, the more likely it is to influence you. Mm -hmm. And so you really have to methodically go through it, the room and turn the things off that you don't need or using at the time. Uh, and if you can make it a, a physical wiring connection, like we talked about with the, with the, uh, uh, the, um, 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 uh, the, uh, the TV, the TV uh, uh, monitor box, um, then um, you can, reduce the amount of bees in the room. And that's where you're creating the cleanest environment by simply turning stuff off you don't use. Um, like your laptop probably has Bluetooth and oftentimes people don't realize it's on. Right. And simply by turning it off, a bit, going through that exercise, you're actually you're actually better off over time by making that reduction. Now, 
when you have a cell phone that you use and it's for business, uh, you always want to make sure it rings uh, and you hear it. When I come home at night, I put my phone at the door and it's not near the living area. I can hear it, but all it's, all of its transmission is far away from me. It's not where we live. So simply by creating distance between what's on is very positive to reduce the exposure. All of these things help you minimize those exposures uh, by taking actions to uh, manage those devices around you. Uh, if you choose to use devices close to you, just keep durations low and um, you're fine. You don't need any other ways of dealing with it. However, if you're doing it a lot, there are kinds of technology devices that can actually shield you from the device fairly effectively. And you can reduce those exposures for when those devices are close to your body. And so those shielding devices can be found in the marketplace. Yeah, I would love to talk about them a little bit. So those are all great tips. I love all of them. So let's talk about some of your devices, why you created them, and what can they do to help protect yourself and your family from EMF exposure? Um, yeah, we, we talked a tiny bit about our start. Um, so I started with um, a, a, a laptop device, a defender pad is what I called it. No, we called it. And it protected my sons. Well, the technology that I created within that could be applied to cell phones. And believe it or not, I was reading an article about th these parents who had bought their daughter, a 16-year-old daughter, a cell phone, insistent that she had it. And uh, she was using it incessantly. And sadly, uh, she had frontal lobe cancer and, and passed away. Oh and and it really upset me because I knew I can stop the signal. I could reduce the exposure. It still works with the cell tower and everything still works, but it doesn't allow the omnidirectional signal to go pass through to the body. And that started me on cell phones. And I started building a whole population of cell phones. Um, and then there was blankets for women. Uh, and kids, I, I wanted to try to protect um, from the environment, uh, 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 pregnant women particularly, um, from these devices that were around them day to day. In fact, by the way, uh, uh, it, uh, there was a study four or five years ago out of San Francisco, and they had, took um, um, first trimester women, gave them a meter. And they monitored them for the first trimester. And they collected the data. And what they found was um, under heavy exposure, uh, there would be um, um, potential for losing the child in the first trimester three times more likely. Wow. So it was in your cell phone, in your back pocket, was influencing the, uh, the fetus. And, and so... Um, part of the reason why we worry about that. And we have actually stuff that women can put around their, their bodies to protect it beyond the blanket. So we have those kinds of products. Um, we even now have a, a, your eyes to the brain, which is your expertise, is mm -hmm. it, it, that's a direct path, Absolutely. as you know, mm -hmm. right? And, and because 15 years ago, our ambient, the, the, the room that we lived in didn't have much electromagnetic radiation in it, we were fine. But our environments today, what we're finding is that the, there are higher and higher elevations of electromagnetic radiation. And so we actually have a, a sleeping mask that has shielding in the front and the sides to protect the brain, basically. And it, it, the feedback that we're getting, getting from the, uh, the various clinics we work with are saying that their, their patients won't, won't go to bed without it because, yeah. because they feel the difference. 
And so we continue to try to uh, find ways of protecting the body. We have uh, caps. They're high-end uh, shielding caps, basically. And uh, an adult story, um, a friend of my sister um, ha had cancer and she, and very hypersensitive to her mm -hmm. environment. She put the, the, the cap on and she won't take it off because she could tell the difference um, of just the minor, small power levels within their environment were just, just bothering her. And so we, we keep on building out products that we hope can protect you, including a clutch a variation where, where you can attach it to your body and run, and walk. And, and so we have those kind of lines. Then the next kind of line was the earbuds. Uh, I was at a conference several years ago and there was an autistic child um, and we had just released our earbuds where I take a, a signal and I convert it to an acoustical, a noise thing, that tube that goes up to my ear and I eliminate all the emissions. Uh, so that was our starting point there. But then I went to this conference and this autistic child didn't want something in their ears. So now we have a child's uh, um, uh, 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 audio connection that eliminates uh, RF as well. Um, and now we have adults. So we, we keep on trying to find ways of eliminating the, the exposures in our environment. Yeah, I think your guys' products are incredible. I use them all the time and people are always asking me about the headphones and how to, you know, eliminate the EMF. So I have a, um, a link for you guys that I'm going to include in the show notes. And I also have it in my Instagram bio, if you guys want to explore their full line of products, but I think that they're really, really just incredible. And I appreciate all the work that you've done to, to put these into play. And also I can't wait to see what you guys come up with next, because as we know, our, our EMF levels are just skyrocketing. Yeah. And I'm sure there's going to be so many new pieces of little equipment that we can use in the future. Kayla, you know, we haven't talked about this, but we talked around it. Um, when you develop shielding, there is a, a maximum frequency rate you can shield from mm -hmm. with the technologies you use. Probably three years ago, we began looking at working with laboratories to develop 5G shielding for the small cell sites. Oh. I was very concerned about the 23 gigahertz, the 60 gigahertz being transmitted into a household. And so um, we, we, we now have in the market Ultra Arma, which, which is a shielding that prevents zero to uh, 90 gigahertz from passing through the device. And we're introducing it on all our cell phones. So if, if you had uh, the 5G, for example, that you're using and, and had one of our products, we prevent that signal from passing through regardless of what it is, up to 90 gigahertz. So um, I'm, I'm sort of excited about that because people would ask me, what can you do about these signals? And I really didn't have good answers because the shielding problem is very, very different than the lower rates. It's more like shielding x-rays than it is shield. Like when you, we can't shield x-rays, only lead can shield x-rays. Right. But, but lead can't shield electromagnetic radiation, RF. Right. They're different physical problems. Um, so um, we're we're very excited about that part because I think that is going to be more and more prevalent in our environment, and we're prepared to help. That's absolutely wonderful. Well, I'm going to include um, a link to your book, your website, all of your details in the show notes. And I appreciate you so much for coming on. This has been absolutely wonderful. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm always excited, as you can tell, with these kinds of things. It really, our our goal is, and your goal is to help people understand so they can make decisions, inform decisions. Um, and that's important. Uh, oh, I, I agree completely. When there's a controversy and someone thinks they're okay and they're, they may not be, they need to understand what the sort of the facts are. Um, and ionized versus non-ionized. I'm glad we talked about it because... For some reason, 
Even experts who know what ionizing radiation is don't know the difference between the mechanics breakdown of the cell between non-ionizing and ionizing. So I appreciated uh, our conversation today about all these things. Absolutely. Hacking was created and is hosted by Kayla Barnes. This podcast is for informational purposes only and views expressed on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Kayla Barnes, does not accept responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of the information contained herein. Opinions of their guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest in products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical issue, consult a licensed physician.